welcome to each of you. It's good to see you always. Your faces are becoming familiar to me, becoming like family. And if I were to look out now and see some of you missing, I would feel badly, so don't let me down, all right? Tonight's travel is very, very special. I want you to fasten your seatbelts while the lights go down. We're going to go together to Masada. It's a rock down on the shores of the Dead Sea. We're from the top of the rock looking down now upon the Dead Sea. In distance, we're only about 30 miles, perhaps a little less than that, from Jerusalem. We are a bit to the east and a fair bit to the south. The waters of the Dead Sea, by the way, are uh, some of the most interesting in all of the world. There is so much salt, saline, and other kinds of chemicals, I guess, in the water that um, you easily float. Folks go down there to swim and because you don't have to worry about putting those little water wings on the kids. They, everybody floats. And the fascinating thing is that if you have a fair amount of body fat, you float higher and higher still. <laughs> Curious the way I got in there and didn't even get wet. <laughs> now here we are from the shore of the Dead Sea looking at Masada, and I want you to notice something here from this vantage point. I'm going to use my pointer. Right in the middle of the screen, there you'll see a zigzag trail. That's called the Snake Trail, ladies and gentlemen. And for hundreds of years, that was the only way up to the top. There was a ladder that allowed you to make the last 20 or 30 feet. How big is the thing? Well, it's 1,400 feet high, this rock that juts up out of the desert. And the top is flat, and it's about uh, 2,000 feet in length at the top. And the shape is very much like the flat iron that we used to heat to iron the clothes with. Anybody old enough to remember that? No? All right. Well, in any event, 150 years before the birth of Jesus, a Jew by the name of Jonathan went up there and built a fort because it was a place of refuge for Jewish warriors who were fighting against the Syrians at the time of the Hasmonean Revolt. They built a wall around the place. How did they do that? Well, they went over the side and quarried back in to the earth that is much stone-like and then they brought those blocks up over and placed them in a perimeter around the top of it. Well, after the Hasmonean Revolt, it was used um, really as just kind of a place of re resort, a place to go up and have a nice view, uh, a place to give you some good exercise if you climb from the bottom up toward the top. You had a wonderful view then of the Valley of Zin and the Dead Sea, and, and you could on a clear day see to the north up to the beautiful mountains of snow at the north end of the Dead Sea. But this place began to take on an air of serious importance when about 60 before Christ, the Romans took the place and continued to hold it until Herod, Herod the Great, decided that he would go up there and make it a winter palace and a winter resort, and that he did. He built two great palaces up on the top of the place, and it was very safe. Any enemy would have to do the dig zigzag thing to try to get up there, and then once they were near the top, they'd have to climb the ladder to gain entry, and it'd be pretty easy to push them back over. So Herod built a great palace with wonderful views, two palaces, both of them with wonderful, wonderful views. Now, we're going to move forward in time and in importance. In 66 AD, a revolt among the Jews against the Romans who were ruling the world broke out. Titus Vespasian, Rome's most able general, initially sent his general Silva over to the Holy Land to put down the Jewish rebellion. Up north from Jerusalem at a village called Jadapada, the Jews had built a wall around the city and were on the inside laughing at the Romans. 
Silva went around a hill and out of sight and had his soldiers build a battering ram. And then they brought the battering ram around the corner of the hill and the folks on the inside stopped laughing. They rolled that huge war machine up against the wall and on the third strike of the ram, the wall caved in and the Romans moved in and destroyed the place. Down in Jerusalem, the folks heard what had been happening up north in Jadapada, and they decided they would reinforce their wall in Jerusalem, and that they did. Titus, bespacing himself, decided it was time to join the battle because Silva was going to have a tough fight down at Jerusalem. And so he came down, and instead of building a battering ram, instead of trying to knock down the wall, he simply played the waiting game. He put the Roman legions in a perimeter around the city of Jerusalem. He knew that on the inside they had sufficient water to last for days and days and days, but he also knew that they did not have enough food to last for more than a couple of months. By the 82nd day of the siege, the folks inside were cannibalizing their dead. Babies were dying, and the old and the sick were dying, and the Jews were cannibalizing them. And a group of them, under the cover of darkness, decided it was time to get out of town. And so about a thousand of them made their way, slipped out of the city, and made their way over to the Dead Sea area, and went up the snake trail and got inside. 960 to be exact. That included men and women and children. Now there's an aerial view of the top of the place, and you see it's not unlike the shape of an iron. And if you look down around the base, by the way, you can see some of the stones still, some of the foundation stones of the, the camps that the Romans placed there when they came to take this thing back in 73 AD. To get there today, you can get aboard this uh, tram. You see the folks going, but still, at the very top of it all, you have to climb a ladder. There it is. The tram doesn't go all the way to the top. And so you climb the ladder the last 30 or 40 feet to gain an entrance to the top. Now, let's talk together about what happened in 73 A.D. Generals Silva and Titus Vespasian, who was soon to become the emperor of all of Rome, moved in on this place. They had taken Jerusalem and all of the other wildfires of Jewish revolt in the surrounding areas, and they moved the armies here. And up on the top, the Jews began to laugh at them. Laugh at Ha, ha, do your best. See, catch us if you can. That was the idea. A man by the name of Eliezer Ben-Jer was the leader of the Jewish zealots, and he led them in their clapping and in their hooting and their howling. So Silva decided that they would build a ramp on the west side of this mountain. And so he put the legions of Rome to work gathering rocks and gathering dirt in wheelbarrow-like affairs and in bushel baskets and in sacks. They began to carry earth to build a ramp. And the Jews up inside laughed more loudly than ever. Even if they came up on that ramp, they'd never be able to breach the wall. They don't have a chance at all. Now, as you look up there, you see the remains of one of the palaces that was built by Herod the Great. And you can imagine him spending the wintertime up there, can't you? And he has plenty of forced labor to bring him everything that his heart desired. There is plenty of water, for they would fill those cavities, those caves from which they had taken the stone to build the wall and to build the palace, filled them up with water. And you can imagine the chore that was, going to the Jordan with horses and wagons and some other devices perhaps, and getting fresh water and bringing it here, and then laboriously taking it up the snake trail up to the top. But if you have enough men, it doesn't really matter if you have all that power. And now we're up near the top and we're looking back down. Imagine the Roman soldiers with spades 
not good shovels like we have today, but really crude instruments, digging up the dirt and putting a few rocks in a bag or in a basket and carrying them over and putting them in place and then tamping them down and tamping them down. Months and months and months went by. And the ramp grew and grew. But still on the inside, the Jews laughed out loud. Now we're going to take a look at some of the ruins that date back to the time of Herod the Great. Well, you see those great stones. Those stones are the drums or sections from the Greek-style pillars of the temple and the palace. And you can see that they had carvings in them to make them very lovely. And after they were all finished and put together, then the craftsmen striated them and painted them so that from a distance they looked like marble. They looked like something that had certainly come from Greece or maybe from Rome itself. And they were living the good life up here and having a good time, plenty to eat, plenty of fresh water. Now hold the revolt of 73 in your minds and let me bring you to modern time. In 1971-72, an archaeologist and a brilliant political mind, a man by the name of Dr. Yigel Yadin, who would teach archaeology and Hebrew history at Hebrew University in the city of Jerusalem, came here and began an archaeological dig. And he found armaments, uh, pieces of armor and weaponry that dated back to the times before Jesus, the hundred years before Jesus and the Hasmonean revolt. And then he found the absolute proof of the palaces of Herod the Great and some of the other things. There are lines that go through these stone walls that they have put back together. Sometimes we can see them pretty well and other times we can't. But <clears throat> below that black line that we may see soon, the stones that are standing there are original. They date back to the time of Herod and the final revolt in 73, and the stones above that were placed there in 1973. Now, this is one of the water tunnels, one of the holes, one of the mines, if you please, from which they took that, um, that building material and then filled it up with water to make it to become a reservoir. We're walking in and amongst the ruins now, that date back to the time. There's one of those black lines. Right in the very center of the picture is that kind of a crooked black line. Everything beneath that is original. It dates back to the time of Herod the Great, and everything above it has been replaced since the time of the, um, the archaeological digs. Some of the buildings have been put back intact, and we could go inside to discover the nice lifestyle that many lived, for they had hot and cold water treatments here. And they had steam baths. Yes, here it is, the bathhouse. Can you imagine again carrying the water up there? That was a chore. In the floor there, you see the results of where the fire burned and where once the tiles were. Here is the well of the cistern. Now you can imagine the Roman soldiers that are working down below and they have to send details miles and miles and miles away to get fresh water. And it's a constant job and a constant worry. And you're allowed only just a few ounces uh, every few hours. And up here, the Jews, on the other hand, are going back in their cistern and bringing out gallons and gallons and gallons of drinking water. And on occasion, from up on the wall, they would throw over a gallon or two. And the Roman soldiers that are building that ramp up near the top would run to try to lap it up. But, of course, it would become mud before they could get to it. Coming out of the bathhouse there. <laughs> now, here, ladies and gentlemen, today is the evidence of that ramp. The engineers of the Roman legions, ever so many yards, put in a great tree trunk. They buried the thing down 15 or 18 feet and left standing up a stump about five feet. And up inside, the Jews wondered, why? What's going on? What do they think they're doing? What a joke. Do they think it's going to grow? But the Romans had a plan. They continued to build the ramp and build the ramp until they had it right up to the base of the wall. And the Roman soldiers could march up to the top, but on the inside... The zealous Jews would laugh at them the more and throw rocks down at them. 
What the Jews did not know was that again, a big battering ramp around the hill and out of sight was being built. What was the purpose of those tree trunks? Well, that was to give leverage to the pulleys to winch that big battering ramp up to the top of the mountain. And when the battering ramp, battering ram was lifted up, raised up, and brought around the corner, the zealots up on the top stopped their laughing. They knew it was only a matter of time now, and they would winch and push and pull and with block and tackle move a few yards every day that great battering ram. When the Romans got the ram up to the top, They cocked it and struck against the wall, and the wall shuddered, but it did not give in. For on the inside, they had lined this area behind the ramp and above the ramp with great timbers. They had dismantled some of the temple work of Herod the Great and reinforced the wall until it was strong enough to withstand, I suppose, a blast of dynamite, or at least that was the thinking of the folks on the inside. They cocked the ram and struck it again, and the earth, the rock earth began to crumble some. And they did it again and again and again. And the rocks crumbled away. But now there were the reinforced timbers. What now do we do? And someone got an idea. Let's burn our way through. The timbers were pitchy. On the inside, they, it was time for a meeting. And so the leader of whom I've already spoken, Eliezer, gathered the men together, and he said to them, if the Romans break in, they're going, to, they're going to desecrate our women and our children. It's going to be ugly, it's going to be nasty, and then they're going to destroy every one of us. And I personally am not willing to die by their hands. He said, I have a plan. My plan is this that when we go to bed tonight, because tomorrow they're going to start the fire and in just a short while it will burn through. When we go to bed tonight, we sleep together with our families, love our children, hold them in our arms. And after the families are asleep and the children and the women know nothing of what's going on, a death guard will go through the camp and will kill everybody. And when he has killed everybody, this man will fall upon his own sword and will take his own life. Do you agree? And they voted, and it was unanimous. And the men went back to their home, back to their places, back to their families, and as if nothing was wrong, they shared the last the evening meal together. And then they went to their places of rest. And on the outside of the wall, the Roman soldiers went up the battering ram, used it as a final approach to the timbers, threw burning material upon the timbers, tar and pitch-like substances, rosins, and then put the torch to them. And it happened that the wind was blowing in just the right direction, and it began to act like a blowtorch. And within about 12 hours, 10 to 12 hours, a hole was burned through. And the Roman soldiers now began to douse the flames and beat against them with dampened sacks. And then the general asked, Are you ready? Are you men ready? Yes, we're ready. They had their weapons in their hands. And they lined up, two abreast. They went across the battering ram and they jumped through the burned hole inside and they shouted the charge. And they were sure now that the Jews would come out of wherever they were hiding. But nothing happened, and their echoes fell back upon their own ears. They decided it's a trick, and so they went back out through the burned hole and regathered round the ram and replanned. And then they made another charge. And when about 150 soldiers had gotten through, they gave the word, there's no one here. It seems there's no one here. And so the rest of the army, hundreds, went through the burned opening, and they began to go into the houses, and there they saw the carnage. All were gone. 
in a remote corner and in a bit of a hole, there they found two ladies and five little children who had caught somehow word of what was going to happen and decided they did not want to die in that way. They were the only survivors of this great tragedy atop the mountain of Masada. Today, many, many hundreds, in fact, of the young Jewish boys are taken to the top of the mountain. They relive the story, and there they are given bar mitzvah and welcomed into the religious circle. But more importantly, I think, the Jewish officers, and for the last 50 years, the Jewish army has been the most powerful army in all of the Middle East. We've talked about that on prior evenings. And one of the reasons they're so very powerful, of course, is that they have been trained by American servicemen and they have the weapons that have been made here with a few exceptions of their own automatic machine guns and so forth. The pilots have been trained here, but the officers climb the snake trail and up the ladder and over the top, and there they are commissioned, and there they take their vow, never again, never again. And I think it is the history of the era and the story of Masada that has made the army of Israel one of the finest fighting machines in all this world. I thank you for traveling with me. Now, subject tonight that we've entitled Here I Come, Ready or Not, is built around the second coming of Jesus. I'm going to be sharing some things this evening that are going to touch a raw nerve in my own heart. They're going to be difficult for me. And so I ask for your indulgence, please. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation, the last book for those who live in the very last days just before Jesus comes again. Revelation chapter 1. We read from Revelation chapter 1 last night, and we shall again this evening. We're going to read the Scripture that is really the theme of not only chapter 1, but of the whole of the rest of the book. It is the fulcrum, if you please, the balance point for the rest of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. I'm going to ask you to follow very carefully while I read, if you will, please. It says, Behold, he comes with clouds. And a few of the folks are going to be able to see him. Is that the way your Bible reads? No. How many then? Every eye shall see him, including also those who pierced him. Huh? You remember when Jesus was standing before the Sanhedrin at that farce of a trial? And he said nothing. And the high priest said, why don't you answer? And Jesus said nothing. And finally, the high priest put Jesus under oath. He said, I adjure thee by the living God. Are you the Messiah or are you not? And the high priest had done the same thing that in the court of law we do today when we say to a witness, you place your hand upon the Bible. Now, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? The high priest has put Jesus under the same kind of an oath. I adjure thee by the living God. Are you the Messiah? Now, Jesus respected the oath, and he answered and said, as it reads in the King James, thou sayest. The other translations say, you've said it correctly. Indeed I am. And then he went on. He said, Behold, I tell you hereafter, you're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory, seated at the right hand of power. And so Jesus, in a courtroom and under oath, said and promised he would come again. And now, here then is the evidence of the revelation Jesus said, you evil, vile men who have taken my life, you who have plotted and planned and schemed against me are going to be made alive to see me when I come. And so we read here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, every eye shall see him, including also those who pierced him, going to be made alive in a special resurrection to see him coming back. And then he goes on to say, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Truly, you can take it to the bank.
When I married my wife, Peggy, I worked for six years for her daddy, who was a logging contractor out of Baker City, Oregon. Back then, in the old time and old timey days, it was simply Baker, but now, of course, it's become much more sophisticated. A lot of Idahoans have moved in, and now it's Baker City. <laughs> You're right, it did, yeah. Started out originally as a mining camp, Baker City. But in any event, I worked for him for six years, and my job was to load the trucks that hauled the logs down to the sawmill. And then we felt, felt the call of God to go to Walla Walla University to t take and study theology, and that we did. But during the summers, I would go back and run a machine for Peggy's dad loading logs. I had just finished my sophomore year and had gone back to work in the logging camps. I've been working for Peggy's dad one week, one week exactly. On a Sunday morning early, he got up and said, I'm going to go out to the job site and build some skid trails. I didn't know exactly where he'd be, but he drew a map for us. And he said, you guys and the kids, you're the, my, grand, my children, my wife's daddy's grandkids, whom he loved so, who are now about ages seven and eight, said, you come out and bring a lunch and meet me. We'll have a picnic lunch together. And so just about noon... Peggy and I and her mother and sister went to the place that we were to meet, and her daddy was not there. I could see where caterpillar tracks had gone over the side of the road and down into the brush. And I took my little kids, one in each hand, and we walked down there, I suppose two or three hundred yards. The further we go out, the further we went, the more steep became the ground until finally it was so steep that you hardly needed to bend over to tie your shoes. We stopped and sat on some logs and listened and we could hear nothing except way down in the canyon, the bleating of some sheep. We went back up to the road and thought perhaps he's going to come with his pickup and meet us. We waited about an hour, and he did not show up. And so we left after eating the little lunch alone, went back home to Baker, and he didn't come in at the usual time, nor an hour later. And about three hours later, there came a phone call. And whomever answered motioned for me. And it happened to be one of Peggy's dad's foremen on the phone, and he asked, are you sitting down? And I said, it's Orin, isn't it? Yes, he said, the caterpillar tipped over and crushed him to death. Peggy's dad may have been the finest man I ever knew. He was kind and gentle, a combination of... of uh, humor and reality blended in a way that everybody loved him. I think probably not a man that had worked for him more than just a few months wouldn't have at any time taken his place to do the dirtiest job. When he would come in in the afternoon from the logging camps, the neighbor kids would come and bring their little pets. He would play with them and tease them and everybody loved him. After the crowds had left the committal where we placed his coffin in the ground, Peggy and our two kids, Tammy and Terry, and Peggy's sister joined hands over that fresh mound. And we prayed that God would keep us faithful so we could meet Grandpa Oren on the day of first resurrection. A few months ago, Peggy and I were working in meetings just like these in Lacey, Washington. We'd opened on a Saturday night, just as we did here, and we opened to a full crowd, a full house, packed. The next morning, Sunday morning, I was running an errand. Somewhere around 10.30 or 11 o'clock, 
I had with me my cell phone. It rang, and I answered, and it was my daughter-in-law, my son Terry's wife. And she said, Lyle, Terry's heart has stopped beating. He's in the emergency room, and, and I don't know what's going to happen. I said, well, keep us posted, please, minute by minute, keep us posted. And she said, I, I promise you, I will. And I turned around and went back to Peggy, and I told her something terrible has happened to Terry. She said, what should we do? Should we head to the hospital? And I said, I don't know. They don't know enough about what's going on yet. They don't know what's caused it, and, and, and maybe it's premature. And, and I said, besides that, I feel like I can't leave the meeting. We just started last night, and, and a huge crowd, and I don't feel like I can leave. A bit later, our daughter-in-law called and said, his heart now has a natural rhythm again, and they have transferred him to intensive care, and things are looking better and so I said to Peggy, let's have our meeting tonight. I'll go and preach, and you sit in the car and pray, and as soon as I'm finished, we'll take off for Boise. And that we did. And in the event that I wouldn't be back the following night, I left them some videos to play of the sermons that I would have preached. We drove through the night. In the interim, our son Troy, who's a nurse from Medford, Oregon, had left his home several hours prior and had arrived at Boise ahead of us. And we met him there at about 5.30 in the morning at the front entrance of the St. Luke's Hospital. And he said, I need to prepare you a little bit, Mom, Dad. Firstly, he looks good. He looks really good. But he said, I'm afraid it's very serious. We went up to his room, the intensive coronary care unit, and he did look good. His body was muscled. His abs showed the result of working out, and he was a picture of health. And I always told him, you got all the looks in the family. Many folks had told us and many times that he looked like Tom Selleck, but I always said, oh, no, he's so much better. <laughs> so much better looking. And the doctors would come and go, and they would say, we're going to do this test, we're doing this, and we're cooling his body down. And uh, in the interim, we learned what had happened. My boy had been in six, six automobile accidents, in the prior 16 years. None of them his fault, curiously enough. But one of them had been really tragic. He'd been driving one Christmas morning about 15, 16 years ago now to take a Christmas card to the lady for whom he drove a big diesel truck. And as he was driving his little compact car down the highway, two men in a full-size pickup turned left right in front of him, said they never saw him. He didn't have time to touch a brake. And he went into the windshield, and the steering wheel went into his chest, and his feet were mashed as the little car crumpled beneath him and around him. And his back was broken, and his right knee was shattered, his leg was broken, and he had concussion, and he was bleeding from the head. And a nurse called me from the hospital and said, Your son has been in a terrible accident, and we're not sure that he's going to live. But he did live. But he lived after that with a great amount of pain, terrible, terrible pain. He'd gone to a number of doctors, including some pain specialists, and they really were not able to help him a lot. He didn't want to get hooked on some of these powerful drugs. He did everything that he could, including very healthful eating, exercising. Two days prior to the event that I'm now describing, He'd gone to a doctor in Ontario, Oregon, and the doctor had given him hope and given him help. He said, I feel better than I have in years and years and years. And so he said, tomorrow, which was the Sabbath, let's load the dogs, for they had no children, but two uh, German shepherd dogs that are worse than kids. Let's load the dogs in the camper and we'll go down to Boise and we'll go through the park and after sundown we will eat at our favorite Indian restaurant and then Sunday morning we'll go to the pet shop and we'll get some special things for the kids, the dogs. And so they did just that. They went to the Indian restaurant and ate 
And then Terry drove their little RV to a commercial area where he had delivered things from his trucking business. There was a man-made lake, and there was green grass. And they played with the dogs and threw the frisbees and the balls and had a good time. And then they went to bed with the plan that they would sleep in and next morning at leisure they would get up and go to the pet store and then go on back to Baker, Oregon. Somewhere around 9 o'clock the next morning, his wife Brenda wakened and she could tell he was breathing erratically. And then she felt for his pulse and it was very faint and very erratic. And she began to try to help him to breathe and at the same time call on her cell phone 911 and the folks at the 911 end said, tell us where you are. We'll send the ambulance. Please tell us where you are. And Brenda said, I don't know where we are. I don't have any idea. We came in here in the dark and I'm not from here. I don't know. And the folks said, you must go find a street corner and give us an address. Please, you'll have to leave your husband. And so she left Terry and went to the nearest corner, ran and got bearings and ran back and called them again. And in three minutes, they were there because they were less than a half mile from the St. Luke's Hospital of Meridian. The doctor took us aside and he said, I'm afraid there may be serious brain damage, brain deficit. Because we don't know how long he was without oxygen. But the signs aren't good. This evening, however, he said... When things slow down a bit, we're going to do a brain scan. And so we took our little family and went to a restaurant and prayed and ate, and then went back to the hospital. They brought Terry back up, and I could see on the faces of the nurses the bad news. And my son, who takes care of patients who were in exactly the same condition as his brother, knew what was going on. He'd read the charts. And so he went to the charge nurse and he said, give it to us just like it is. And she did. She said the result of Terry's problem was a hemorrhage from the brain. And he is brain dead. talked with Brenda, prayed, and then called the nurse and said, we don't want to prolong this. And if ever there was one ready to meet Jesus, it was my boy Terry. Talked about him endlessly. Well, he drove up and down the freeways in his truck, listened to the Bible on tapes and, and listened to other Christian books and listened to Christian music always. And he'd come to visit you and he'd talk so much about Jesus and, and his love that sometimes you wished he'd talk about something else. I'd give a million dollars to hear him again. Our son Troy said... We can do this one of several ways. He said the fastest way to let him go is to turn off his breathing machine. And he said it'll be a matter of minutes only, but the last few moments are not going to be pretty. He's probably going to convulse. He said my suggestion is they turn off the heart medicine machine. It'll take a little while, but his heart will just slow down and slow down and then stop. And so we gathered, his mother and I on one side, his brother and wife on the other. And we held him and hugged him and kissed him in 
one hour. He's gone to sleep in Jesus. We took his cremains. We just the close family, his brother, sister, nephews, nieces, his mother. We put them in a little hole atop his grandpa. Then his brother and sister closed the grave. Then the immediate family gathered again. And prayed that same prayer. Keep us faithful, Lord. Until we're caught up together. When Thanksgiving came, Peggy said, I don't want to stay home. Our home was the gathering place for the kids and grandkids and everybody. Thanksgiving and Christmas, she said, I just can't stand to be home. And so our granddaughter, who just had a new baby, great Peggy, by the way, is a great grandmother. Can you imagine that? My Peggy is a great grandmother. You know what that makes me. <laughs> Proud, by the way. They said, come and be with us in Austin. Fly down and we'll have Thanksgiving in Austin. And we'll take you and show you where Willie Nelson lives. And they did that. And as we flew back from Austin to Medford and somewhere, somewhere at 40,000 feet above El Paso. Does that not sound familiar? God gave me these words for Terry. I guess, Lord, that I've always known about the son you lost, but I didn't fully appreciate the awful cost. You looked down with a breaking heart and watched him as he died. His mother stood beside him and softly cried. Now I better understand the pain you bore. You knew this coming tragedy long before. But you said he was eternally on the cross. You suffered in anticipation your own son's loss. Not long ago, I held my son and watched him die. I heard his mother weep and say goodbye. We've soaked the pillow soft, his mom and I, recalling with pain and joy those days gone by, thankful for the promised meeting in the sky. So I better understand, I better understand the pain you bore. And along for the return of sons, yours and mine. So much, much more. Would you open your Bible, please, to Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. We've read from here before and must do it again tonight because it's vital to our study together, the second coming of Jesus, the blessed hope toward which all creation moves and longs. Matthew chapter 24, and I'm going to read for us Several verses, beginning with the first. Matthew chapter 24. And I'll begin with verse 1 
and we shall see how time allows as we begin to read on down through. You remember now the context. Our Lord Jesus has um, begun to answer the question of His disciples. Tell us, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming in the, the end of the world? And Jesus said it will be like this and this and this and this and this. So follow now while I read. Matthew 24, 1. Jesus then departed the temple, and His disciples came to Him and said, Look at these beautiful buildings. Look at this beautiful temple. And Jesus said, Take a good look. But I tell you this, there's not going to be one stone left upon another that will not be thrown down. And then while I sat on the side of the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately, and they said, Lord, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of Thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, I want you to notice the disciples asked a twofold question, but they really in their minds had them together. When is that temple going to be knocked down? Is it going to be the very last day when you come in your second coming? And Jesus, in answer, gave them a prophecy with a dual application. It had an application for the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 A.D., but it had a fuller, broader application for the last days when Jesus comes in His second coming. Tell us, they said, what will be the signs of your coming and the destruction of the temple and the end of the world? And Jesus said... Take heed that no one deceives you. For they're going to come a lot of folks in my name saying, I am Christ, they'll deceive very many. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, but don't be troubled. Uh, these things are going to come to pass, but the end isn't yet. Nation is going to rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there are going to be famines in different places and earthquakes in places where they've never had them before. Oh, and by the way, did you hear the world news tonight? Did you happen to hear it? You remember we talked about the Cascadia Fault about two nights ago? Did you hear in the world news tonight that just off the Oregon coast, just out from Bandon, uh, several miles, there was an earthquake of over five, I think five, five or something like that? Yeah, amazing. You know, we need to keep our ear to the ground, but we're living in the last days. And then in verse 8, he says, these are but the beginning of sorrows. They're going to deliver you up and you'll be afflicted and they're going to kill you and, and you're going to be hated by everyone because of me. Then there are going to be those that are offended, and, and some are going to betray one another, and, and you'll see hate grow. There will be many false prophets that will come and deceive many. And because iniquity abounds, the love of many is going to wax cold. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And then this gospel of the kingdom has to be preached into the whole world for witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. I'm going to pause right there for a moment. We're going to begin to enlarge upon this dual application business. Our Lord Jesus said the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. would be an example. It would be the paradigm for the end time and the second coming. In the meantime, he said there are going to be a lot of difficulties. Now, the city of Jerusalem was a city of extreme beauty. It really was one of the modern mar It was the well, ancient wonder of the world. It was considered to be the place of great pride, and it was often referred to by Jewish people as the glory, the glory of Jerusalem. But the city had rejected Jesus. They disallowed him to preach inside the temple. And so Jesus, in Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28, you remember, wept as he overlooked the city. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I would have gathered you under my wings like a mother hen does her chicks, but you wouldn't let me and then he said, your house is going to be left unto you desolate. He was talking about the temple. Now let's talk about some of the parallels and the destruction of Jerusalem as it was a sign, a paradigm for the last days. In Luke chapter 21, and I want you to turn there with me, we need to read from verses 10 and 11. Luke chapter 21, reading verses 10 and 11. The very same subject matter now. Jesus said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in different places, famines and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great wonders there shall be. Now you tell me what it says. Where are the great signs and wonders going to be? In the heavens. All right? Great signs and wonders there are going to be in the heavens. Adventist. Adventist. That means folks believe in the second coming of Jesus. It's one of their main tenets. It is a teaching and a belief toward which they move and long. And I read not long ago about an old guy by the name of Enoch. He's spoken about in Jude, that little one chapter book before the Revelation in verse 14. In Jude, verse 14, it says about Enoch, Behold, he saw the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. 
The, the hope of the second coming was given to God's children in the garden at the time of sin. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God promised He will bruise thy head. And that's talking about the ultimate victory of our Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul from prison would write his last letters to Timothy and to Titus. And he would refer to the second coming as the blessed hope. I long for the glorious appearing, the blessed hope. I want to say to you and I tonight and all of our hearts, it is not only just the blessed hope, it is our only hope. It's the only hope for this trip, traveled, uh, tra troubled world of ours. Get your kids ready. Our Lord Himself said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it weren't true, I'd have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again. Now, I want to underscore something for you here, and maybe you've never quite thought about it in this light. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Hmm? Your heart. The atheist, all right, let his heart be troubled. The agnostic, let him be troubled. The infidel may be troubled. The, the modernist may be troubled. The hedonist and the skeptic might be troubled. And the secularist is going to be troubled. But let not your heart be troubled, for Jesus is coming again. And his coming is not an allegory or a metaphor or some kind of a parable. It's real. This same Jesus that ascended up into the heavens in a cloud is coming back. The same Lord that walked the weary mild. The same Jesus that calmed the seas. The same Lord who opened blinded eyes, the same Jesus who was beaten bloody and dragged a heavy cross and died and was buried in the grave and rose again, is coming again. This same Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says in the interim, He's our great high priest. Ever intercedes for us. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul said, Let our minds always be in heaven, from where also we look for the coming of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And at the end of his own life and ministry, he would write to the young preacher Timothy in the fourth chapter, of the second book and the seventh verse, and he said, I fought a good fight, and I've finished the course, and I've kept the faith. I've hung in there. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give me at his appearing, and not to me only, but to all those who anxiously long and look for it. Titus 2.13, the glorious, blessed hope of Jesus. Revelation chapter 21 says, that just before he comes on a rescue mission, the final mission, he's going to stand up from that heavenly courtroom where he's been our high priest, and he's going to shout to the whole universe, it is done. It's done. I've been asked on several occasions, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you tonight what it means. It means that rape and riot and robbery and rage and rust are over. It's done. It's finished. It's no more. And pain and sorrow and separation and sin are finished. They're gone. It's no more. And no longer will my sweet little granddaughter cry bitter tears because of the multiple sclerosis that her mother has. It is done. My favorite preacher my dear friend Charles Brooks said this, and I love it. When he breaks through the skies, he's going to tear open the cemeteries, tear them up. And the saints are going to come out of their graves like popcorn on the top of a hot stove. I like that, don't you? And we shall be changed. We'll be changed. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, 17, the Lord himself descended from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be what now? Caught up together with him, raptured up, snatched up. I'm going to fly, folks. I took my first airplane ride when I was five years old. It was in one of those open cockpit things, and the guy decided he'd do some acrobatics up there, and I have a problem with motion sickness, and, and it scared me, and I was really cold beside all of that, and from that time on, I haven't really cared for flying. Peggy loves it, on the other hand. My son Troy loves it. They go together, and they fly in helicopters and all kinds of wonderful things. 
I fly when I have to. And you've heard about white knuckle landers. I'm white knuckle taker offer and everything in between. And there comes a little bit of a bump and I jump and face it's all right, dear. It's going to be all right. I've been asked on occasions more than once, are you afraid of flying? And I say, no, I'm not afraid of flying. I I'm not afraid of the fall. It's that sudden stop that bothers me, however. <laughs> and besides that, I read from my Jesus, lo, lo, I'm with you always. <laughs> I'm going to fly. I'm going to be snatched up. Higher and higher. Until with my boy and my father in law and my daddy, you and your loved ones. Meet together in the arms of Jesus. One sat alone behind the, beside the highway begging. His eyes were blind, the light he couldn't see. He clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows. And then Jesus came and set the captive free. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. And when Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away, for he takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. And all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. Let's pray. Thank you, dear God, for your promise. Thank you, sweet Jesus. For your testimony given in a courtroom, I will come again. Your promise to your friends in an upper room, I will come again. It's the blessed hope. It's that promise that gives us the courage to leave the fresh mound and face tomorrow and the next day. Even so, then, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.